welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Milk, it does not do a body good, at least not for adults and especially not for kids, except, that is, if it's from A2 cows. You see, most dairy products found in the U.S. grocery stores come from a breed of cow, such as a Holstein, that's that black and white cow, that is a highly inflammatory type of milk protein called casein A1. That's why I'm so excited to have the Alexanders on today. They are one of the only A2 dairy farmers in the U.S. Husband-wife duo Stephanie and Blake, plus their five kids, are truly pioneers in the A2 dairy industry and also in farming as the first certified regenerative farm. So pay attention. We'll find out why organic just isn't enough, how farming like our grandparents will help heal the planet, and while A2 dairy products are optimal if you're going to drink milk. So stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss hearing about their incredible story of running a family farm and what you can do to help facilitate regenerative agriculture in your community. We'll be right back. So, welcome to the podcast, Stephanie and Blake. It's so good to see Alexander A2 milks and yogurts more available in more grocery stores these days. Thank you. Thank you. We're honored to be here. So, first things first, what's wrong with conventional agriculture? You, you guys are farmers. What, what's wrong? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's taken a, a turn um, over the last eight or ten decades that has just industrialized everything in terms of uh, focusing on high yield only, I, I would say. And, and, you know, I went to college 40 years ago, or we went to college 40, 35 and 40 years ago, and... Uh, you know, they really weren't teaching us about the soil other than the, the basic uh, minerals in the soil, uh, but certainly nothing about biology. And so I think that's what's missing in, in conventional agriculture. And then also within regards to just dairy specifically, a lot of people have moved away from dairy and there's got to be reasons why, whether it's um, the method, the style, or they just can't digest it or it doesn't agree with them and, and not healthy for them any longer. So do you, do you think if we went back 100 years that the idea that people had milk intolerance would, would be very different based on the way cattle were grazed 100 years ago? Yeah, yes. we, we, we do tend to believe that. Um, we, we think that it's um, certainly the cow, uh, the cattle industry um, and the, the dairy cow itself has changed because we do have that corrupted gene, um, which we will call A1, in there that causes a lot of difficulty for a lot of people all around the world. And, and so we just don't know if that change happened a thousand years ago or more or less, right? Somewhere along the line, the cow changed, not, right. not, not, not our guts necessarily. However, you understand this really well. You, and by the way, thank you for teaching us about lectin. That, that, that was very helpful <laughs> for, for our family. Um, but, a pleasure. Uh, you know, we, we've got you know, gluten intolerant people and we now have extreme dairy intolerant people. And, and so we think of this protein problem in dairy somewhat akin to the gluten intolerance. Uh, you know, the wheats have changed and the and the milk has changed, and, and then our, our our lifestyles have changed, so our guts aren't maybe as healthy to handle this stuff, where 100 years ago, to get back to your question, people weren't noticing intolerances. Right. They, they, they could handle it because they were rugged. They were growing up on farms. They were exposed to everything, and, and, and you know, we, we and have they a different society. And now. they didn't have the stressors that they have now. Um, maybe A1 was already there 100 years ago, but the other stressors weren't making their body um, susceptible to an A1 because they were healthy everywhere else. But now with all the multiple of stressors with modern food, then we're going to be, people are going to be more sensitive to everything. No, that's a good point. Uh, as I, I point out in my books that 95% of us are born with an antibody to the peanut lectin 
Mm -hmm. And yet, probably when you were growing up and I was growing up, nobody had peanut allergies. We, right, right. You know, everybody ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches yeah. and had peanuts on planes and yeah. nobody was carrying EpiPens to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and now, of course, you know, peanut allergies are rampant. Right. And, but, you know, our immune system, the, the, the antibodies still existed, but it, our mm -hmm. immune system was calmed down by we had a normal gut microbiome teaching our immune system and we didn't have leaky gut mm -hmm. and you're right so it's the same thing with i think casein a1 uh probably if we had didn't have a leaky gut and we had a great microbiome um that wouldn't have been a big a problem as it is now yeah right. correct. yes that's, that's how we look at it okay so um, you're uh, right. So you're a dairy farmer, and all my vegans say <laughs> you guys and your cows are the cause of climate change because your cows are farting, and you know we got to get rid of you guys. So what say you? <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity there. That yeah, that 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 gets right to the quick. So. I, I, we believe that we're part of the solution and not, not part of the problem. And so we would certainly welcome any of those uh, folks that are, have those concerns to come visit us, come see our farm and come understand, I mean, start with our website, but understand how we do our farming. And, and we're truly part of the solution. Um, you know, I think cows get a bad rap. I, I, I firmly believe that. Uh, we've got less bovine in the, in the country today than we, we did years and years ago. And, um, and that methane that they make is, is, uh, has a 10 year shelf life. So it's kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're lowering that number, not increasing it, but, but let's really talk about the soils and what we've come to understand through being organic and really learning and educating ourselves on soil and, and how we sequester carbon with our, farming practices. And so, you know, we are truly part of the solution and cattle are a big part of that solution in, in, in that, you know, we need the cattle's ruminant to digest some of these uh, large uh, fibrous plants and species out there, uh, the, the cellulose that humans can't digest. And those animals help us add biology to that. Um, through their urine and manure back on the ground. They're contributing and feeding the, the soil microbes and then ultimately sequestering carbon in the soil through roots and, and, and other uh, plant material that becomes part of the soil. And, and in our world, it's, it's organic matter that we measure. It's a real simple test. And our organic matter in our soils have gone from 2 to 3% uh, when we started 25 years ago or so up to eight, 10, 12, 15% now. And, you know, it's a phenomenal story. And, and, and half of that organic matter is carbon. And so we're, um, we're basically, as a dairy farmer, we're grass-based dairy farm uh, farmers. And that's a way we have farmed for four generation. Now our fifth generation is, is helping us out. And so it's a way that mimics um, the wildlife, the buffalo, where you do a rotational grazing and that is all part of what we're doing in, in a regenerative organic approach. So are you so you're moving, I mean, just like Buffalo Rome, mm -hmm. uh, you're moving your cows from pasture to pasture? Yes, yes. absolutely. We're, we're cycling the, the grass growth. So, so the grass grows above the ground, say 12 to 18 inches tall. And under the ground, the roots are growing to kind of somewhat mimic and match the, the volume that's above ground. And as you harvest it off using cattle, um, you know, they, they go in and we, we put a lot of cattle in a small space and they eat it all. And, 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 and then, uh, of course, they leave the nutrients as well as taking some out. That, um, but then those roots, um, some of them engage in rapid growth and, and regrow the green material up top, which becomes a solar plant that's pulling carbon again out of the out of the air. Um, but also some of those roots just die off. They slough off and become little spaces in the in, in the soil for the microbes to live, for the, the water to transfer through. And then it leaves that carbon in the soil to be part of the permanent structure and part of the, the tilth of the soil. So you don't, um, so with regenerative agriculture, let's, 
for people who hopefully have been watching my podcast, we've talked about it before, but for people who are first listening and hearing the word regenerative agriculture, uh, define that. Uh, you've you've kind of done it, but what exactly does that mean? Yeah, I, I think in simple terms, it's regenerate soil. So let's build soil and um, and and get away from soil erosion and and. And, and whether that's wind erosion or water erosion or, or whatever, but regenerating soil. And, and, and when you regenerate soil, so we're literally building topsoil. So maybe our fields are getting taller every decade. It, it's that kind of approach. Just visualize that they're growing by an inch or two um, because we're adding, we're adding bulk to the soil. And yeah. as, as you do all that and you increase the organic matter, it increases the, the nutrient load in the soil, the microbes, all the bug, bugs and good critters, that's increasing the nutrient density in the plant. And that's ultimately what we're after is nutrient density in the plant for the cows to graze on. And the byproduct of it and the goodness of it is that we're sequestering carbon and it's getting notoriety. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, I, it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the level of topsoil uh, in the United States has plummeted right. drastically, right? Yes, yes, through this industrial revolution of agriculture. And those soils are dead. Yeah, and, and so our, you know, one of my personal missions, one of uh, the things that I like to work on is by being involved with some of the advocate groups that uh, farmers are involved with, uh, you know, I go to Washington, D.C. three or four times a year and talk to, you know, legislators and, and a lot of policymakers. And, you know, my dream is to help or I'd say our dream is to help agriculture change and, and conventional farmers across the country to understand that some of these regenerative practices would be super good and smart of them to implement in that it translates to healthier soils, uh, translate to healthier and and, and and larger yields, which, you know, ultimately helps pay the bills. And if we can't pay our bills as farmers, then nothing we do is sustainable. And so that, that's really important. That's an important piece of this puzzle is that we have healthy farms. And, and so that, therefore, we need consumer support to, you know, to support the regenerative labels and to support the practices that we're doing. But it also has to, you know, apply where we can convince our conventional neighbors to kind of come along on this ride because it makes sense. So there's a many people say that, you know, regenerative agriculture is much too expensive and that you, you poor farmers mm -hmm. uh, can't make a living do, doing this and you gotta use petrochemical firm, fertilizers and herbicides uh, to make a living, and I suspect your conventional farm farmer friends buy into that. Is that true? I, I'm not really sure about what they're buying into from that standpoint, but I know for us, and um, when you talk about it being expensive, we we have the benefit of composting, of course, our, our manure solids, but we use for bedding local shavings from the lumber mills, and we also get um, fish waste and um, really any green waste we can get. And we're composting constantly and doing quite a effective compost program. And then we're reapplying it to our fields and that's nutrition going back to the fields. And that has helped us in the regenerative uh, project and build that organic matter in the soils. Yeah, yeah. so we, we would encourage farmers around the country to get anything free that they can that can be an organic source uh, you know, to, to assist and to start a compost pile. Um, I'm just thinking back to your question 30 years ago when we were probably before we had even entertained the idea of becoming an organic farm. So we were still using some urea to fertilize our fields and urea is a wonderful, fast responding uh, nitrogen source for our grasses and, and different plants that we grow in our pastures. And, and, you know, it was a really convenient tool. And so I understand how farmers get um, somewhat dependent or even addicted to, you know, the, these kind of quick responding chemicals and, and, and uh, fertilizers. And I'll, I'll just tell you, once we went away from that, 
the response that we get from a compost uh, application of fertility and soil amendment is it's just long term. It keeps giving year after year, season after season. And so we would notice that our fields didn't get all yellow in, in the in the fall and summer or fall and winter when when we weren't applying the chemical. It, 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 there's a, a long term benefit and it just keeps literally snowballing in a really positive way. And and, and so part of this is, is we we'd encourage farmers to be patient and, and to just, you know, kind of build it and they will come. And what's coming is the microbiology in your soil. And they're going to, you know, as, as farmers, this is the, the, the lesson that we learned, not not in college, but out here in, on the ground is that it's our responsibility to do nothing that harms those biology, or all that biology critters that are working on our behalf. Really just stay out of their way and let's feed them and, and do things that are good for them. So it's the microbiome of our farm, if you will, that we're, we're really trying to focus on and pay attention to. And just like you're telling your listeners about gut biology and the goodness of what you can do to make your gut healthier, we're doing that same effect to our soils. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings is you are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. Uh, I think maybe our listeners need to hear that grass is not necessarily grass, that uh, grass that's supported by a rich soil microbiome is going to absorb far more nutrients than grass basically grown in dead soil with petrochemical fertilizers. And that's going to be delivered into the cow and subsequently in the milk. Um, is that saying it correctly? Yeah. It, yes, correctly. It, it, it absolutely is. Uh, it, as you're asking that question, I'm thinking, I, I think your listeners need to understand that, that our cattle are, are really... Um, a bit old fashioned, if you will. And so we have spent 30 years selecting genetics that were um, the right genetics for grazing. In other words, they're they're almost like athletic. Um, they're they're a little smaller framed. They have the ability to to literally walk a mile to the field if they need to and and go out and, and work for a living and, and get their own feed out of the field. And so they're not pampered. They're not sitting in a corral where we just keep bringing feed to them. So there's a lot of a lot more to that story. Um, the consequences are we get less milk per cow, but we also get a much higher quality milk per cow in, in terms of a lot more butter, fat, and protein. And and I, I'm just going to say, you know, conjugated linoleic acid, the good stuff that is 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 making people healthy, is a result of that. Um, and, and so it's, it's it's literally different kinds of cows that that um, that we focused on, and then of course, in, in, in well, 15 years ago or so, or 14 years ago, we learned about A2 and started focusing on that because we're we're open-minded to to a lot of things, and so A2 made sense to us, and and we've been certainly selecting for that uh, along the way. And then because of that style of breeding for all these years and something we noticed about our milk before we launched our own brand was the amazing taste. And I love it when we get somebody from a foreign country and they might be older and they taste our milk and they tell us that it takes them back to their childhood because that's the way milk used to take taste in Yugoslavia or in Romania or something yeah. like that. The old and country. The that's old what they country. say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that warms our heart because we know our milk has a special taste and people buy it maybe because they can't drink milk and they want to try the A2-ness of it, but they keep buying it because it tastes so great. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, uh, you know, I actually, I have a patient who um, had a dairy farm in Minnesota uh, growing up. Uh, she was a child then, and they were Guernsey cows. They were <laughs> A2 cows. And they had to uh, switch over to Holstein because uh, Guernsey's, uh, I'm bringing close, coal to Newcastle, but Guernseys don't produce as much milk um, as Holsteins, and they're not as hardy as Holsteins. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of forced, to, even though they knew it was better, yeah. uh, they were just yeah. kind of forced commercially yeah. to do it. 
Yeah, and 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 I we totally understand that that transition that that farm family went through, and we've seen that all over the the country. And um, I, I guess what we did somewhere along the line here is is really recognize that we were focusing on grazing, which was really a core part of uh, our uh, our upbringing. And um, our, our son, our oldest son, lives in Ferndale and, and dairies on the dairy that my great grandfather started a hundred years ago, and we. Wow. We've been grazing on that that farm for five generations, and all we've done is 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 learn more about the soil and learn more about the process and the and, and the management of grazing, kind of the art of grazing. Right. And and that's you know uh, I'd, I'd like to give out a, a shout out to Stan uh, Stan Parsons and Alan Savory for that. Back when I was in college, I learned about those guys, and then I really got to know Alan Savory and the Savory Institute. And, and we really appreciate the evolution of his his uh, his understanding of how ruminants are, are part of saving our planet, if you will. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I suspect you're aware of the dentist Weston Price. Oh, um, of course. We, I we, yes, <laughs> and I say that when we went organic and stuff, and even before, Blake, be who's an excellent cowman, became a soil and grass enthusiast and was reading all kinds of things about soils. And I was reading Nutrition and Physical Degeneration in 2001 because I went to, we went to Sally Fallon's classes. So we're big fans of Weston A. Price. And our attitude in our kitchen is eating foods the way they were a few hundred years to be eaten and making that bone broth soup and, and our milk that we produce is that way too. Well, I thought it was interesting. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that book. It's actually one of the first books I read back when I changed my career. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he points out, as you know, he, um, he revised his original book to talk about the uh, Activator X yeah. that he found in the milk products, particularly butter in cows that were grazing on rapidly growing grass. And subsequently, it's almost certainly uh, vitamin K2. Mm -hmm. It also may be uh, two interesting new uh, saturated fats that are odd chain fatty acids called C15 and C17 that are actually probably essential fatty acids that have recently been discovered. And that's also in the milk and butters of grazing uh, cows. Mm -hmm. And it may be uh, one of the exciting essential fatty acids that nobody knew about except Weston Price. Of course, he didn't know the name of it. Right. Um, one thing, you, you, you may be aware of this. Uh, up until 1984, true Parmesan cheese, Parmigiano-Reggiano, could only be made from the milk of cows that were grazing on spring or fall grass. Uh, it was against the law to use summer or, uh, or winter uh, hay or grasses. Um, and I, th I think that's fascinating. You can still find um, those cheeses from summer and uh, fall grasses made into Parmesan cheese if you look hard for them. But I think, you know, they were, they knew all this and you yeah. guys as fourth generation farmers know all this. Yes. Yeah, and because we live right on the ocean, on the Oregon border in Northern California, our grass is green all year round. So most of the year we're rotating our cows to new green growing grass. So that season is lasting a lot longer than say Switzerland, where Dr. Price discovered the yellow butter in the spring yep. where they had that sacred food. So when we look at the top of our bulk tank, our milk tank, and the cream's all on the top, there's a yellow hue most of the year because our cows are grazing. And that yellow hue is only found in cows grazing green grass. Yeah. So that yeah. Activator X or K2, it's yep. real in our milk. And we feel, always feel great. Yeah. And we think it is because of the dairy, the milk we drink here at the farm. Yeah, and, and we certainly understand why the Parmesan folks, uh, you know, honored the spring milk uh, mm -hmm. because that's when the green grass is growing, and it does affect and change. So uh, the the products, obviously, and, and what Stephanie's saying is we have an extended season of that here. But you know, growing up here, uh, I grew up 
you know, down there where, where our son lives now in Ferndale, where Humboldt Creamery used to make butter, and our butter was oh, yeah. extremely yellow, much like your necktie there today. And and it was uh, it, it 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 bothered some of the new potential customers because they wanted to know why this butter was so you know the color was so extreme. And well, it's because all the cows were eating grass, even in this you know conventional world, forty and fifty years ago. So what's the difference? Uh, people are now going, okay, well, if, if the milk is organic, they're re eating grass. What's the difference between organic and regenerative uh, farming? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. So I haven't tried to think of that answer yet, but, but it's really, we're talking about Let's, organic is a certification, and so you, you, you need a third-party certifier to you know, verify that you're doing this, this, and this. And, and what you're not doing is antibiotics in cattle, and you're not doing pesticides and chemicals on your soils, and, and some basic things like that. You're only utilizing feeds and uh, inputs that are also qualified as organic. So, so that's generally what organic means. And I think that's certainly taken, you know, consumers grabbed onto that and, and embraced that over the last 30 years in, in a wonderful way. Uh, regenerative came along and, and somewhat became a, a program and a definition to define something that I'm gonna say my grandfathers were already doing and, and generations for eons have been doing. I don't think regenerative farming is so, so as new as we all would like to pretend it is. I think it's really honoring a system that God created, and 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 um, understanding it better. And so we eagerly jumped on, uh, you know, two different uh, regenerative programs that we're developing over the last four years, um, and 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 became, you know, kind of a pilot farm for both of them. And, and so that's how we ended up being, you know, the country's first certified organic dairy farm, uh, I mean, That's I'm true. sorry, regenerative uh, farm, is that we just embraced the concept because, you know, they came along with a word that helped define what we were really doing as grazers. It, it's So was it, was it hard to make the transition? Um, did you have to throw out old practices or did you have to add new practices? I mean, where do you start? No. Um, I, I don't, it wasn't hard at all for us because of our uh, step into organics first. And, and so it was a natural evolution. And, and again, you know, I'm just going to say it again. I, I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a program that came along and endorsed it and then named what we were already doing because as good grazers, we want to build soils when we were building organic matter, not necessarily carbon in the soil, but carbon's a result of the organic matter. And so because we wanted to build organic matter and we were doing compost and we were doing um, kind of intensely managed uh, rotational grazing um, that built soil and, and you know, it, 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 we were doing it because it, it was a smarter business decision. It grew more feed and fed more animals and paid more bills. And so when you have that component and then you just begin to understand what it's doing biologically under the soil and from a, you know, a kind of a global warming perspective in that we're sequestering carbon, it, wow, it just absolutely makes sense. And, and it just motivates you to, to kind of help tell the story and, and to do more. Okay. So, um, how do you, how do you convince, uh, fellow farmers? How do you convince, politicians, how do you convince big dairy to regress and regenerate, you yeah. know, go back a hundred years? I, I think that's the, the consumers that need to do that. You know, what are they going to buy? It's, it's about a health that they want to have. And like politicians, our health care bill should be tied to our farm and food bill. They should be talking to each other. What what should be subsidized? What what should be helped out? Consumers need to look at what they're eating, and food is thy medicine. And a lot of consumers today vote with their dollar every single day. And there's a cost to food. 
there is. And if it's a like cost is bad health, if you're not eating healthy food, or is, is it a not satisfying ecosystem if you're purchasing um, industrial food? Those things need to be brought to the table. It's the consumer that has to ask for it. And it's the consumer we are praising and bowing and bowing down to that they appreciate what we're doing here at a farm level. And I, I would answer that a little differently. And I think what Stephen said is also true. That's one side of the equation. You mentioned politicians and kind of policy, let's, if you will, that how, how so again, that's that's these trips that I want to make to D.C. and continue to do and, and participate in that conversation so that we can help direct and focus policy that encourages farmers uh, to to embrace some of these um, practices. And then, um, you know, it's just kind of one farm at a time. It has to happen. It's it's. It's a, you know, it's a long ways from converting the entire, say, dairy industry. Um, you know, that, that, that's absolutely overwhelming. But if we can just do regions and, and, and uh, different crops and, 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 you know, have the effect on, on different crops. I gave a, a talk at the uh, annual American Farm Bureau um, in Austin, Texas, a couple of years ago, and it was titled Honor Soil Like You Would Your Grandchildren. And, and so if we can get those concepts out to farmers that, you know, even the guy growing cotton or corn in the Midwest needs to pay attention to this conversation and build organic matter and, and regenerate soil, it, they need to do that because of their, their kids and their grandkids and, and the prosperity of their farm. Um, you know, it, it's more likely to pass on to the next generation if it's profitable. It's it's that simple. So sometimes it just boils down to the money. Well, that's a good segue to your fam, the family farm, the Alexander family farm. Mm -hmm. And you've got five kids mm -hmm. and they're they're a part of your your farm. And that's uh, that goes that bucks the trend of, oh, my gosh, you know, I grew up on a farm and I can't wait to get out of here and do something useful. How'd you do that? Well, I remember we were driving 20 years ago and talking about um, a grazing dairy that we have and, and we should go organic. And it seemed to be the good option to create a viable future for our kids. So ultimately, it was a business decision to go organic 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then as we went organic and became um, that family that became an organic consumer because we saw the value in it, we realized it. And it really became the attitude, build it and they will come. Build the soil and the microbes will come and the grass will grow. Build a business that is attractive to our kids to want to come home after they go to college yeah. and, and they have. And so that really was our attitude. Like I said, we thought it was a business decision, but then it became a purposeful life for a farmer. Yeah, I, I would add to that, that that drive that she's talking about. That we specifically remember we were we were touring farms in northern uh, Oregon and, and the, on the coast. And it was much like the area I grew up in, Ferndale. And a lot of those farmers or dairymen up there were wanting to get out. They they said, "Oh, you're from California. You want to buy my farm?" Three out of six said that to us in one day, and it just shocked me. And so as we're driving home with all five kids in the car, and this was actually 23 years ago. Um, you know, Stephanie and I are talking, how do we create a, a, a business where our kids, you know, can grow up, go to college, meet their spouse, make an adult decision uh, in terms of their career? And, and, you know, how can we rank in that and, and not, you know, force them into something that's less than ideal? And so we've been kind of chasing niche markets and, and, and new concepts and being very open minded. Um, you know, since that day, and primarily because we wanted to build a business that was attractive to the next generation. Yeah, and then on the subject, build it and they will come. As we built that organic matter, as we fenced the, the creeks on our ranch and that planted trees in the riparian zones, the elk came, the bald eagle nest came, mm -hmm. the salmon started going through the creeks again, the frogs galore everywhere. And so it's fun to talk about just the wildlife in our ecosystem that we live around and um, then say, by the way, we're organic regenerative dairy farmers. To make it, you know. Yeah. 
So uh, I, I know we, we've talked about A2 milk mm -hmm. and did it, did you have to transition your herds to, you know, pure A2, A2 cows? Uh, I mean, how do you go about doing that? Basically, we first started with um, selecting sires, selecting the bulls for, that were A2. We were able to, through New Zealand genetics, the Kiwi genetics that are there, we were able to select sires to breed to our cows that were 100% A2. A2, A2 is a, the DNA. You get one from mom, one from dad. Right. So that's why we say A2, A2 on our bottle to call that out. And so we're looking for that DNA. And then we test our cows by taking a hair sample from their tail and send it to a lab. Back then we sent it to New Zealand and now we send it in the States. And we basically separate our A2 cows that are 100% A2 from those that still had the A1 gene. And we've been doing that now for about 15 years or so. And, and I think, you know, specifically, uh, it, it's, a, it's a long transition on the entire population of all the cattle that we own in our herd. Um, but because we milk in more than one barn, it was easier to take and identify, simply identify the A2, A2 cows and put them all in one milk barn. And then 100% uh, you know, of that milk or that ranch is now A2. And so we, we've been milking in four locations and three of them are 100% and the other one is 50-50 and still transitioning. Gotcha. Now, can, can the average consumer uh, detect A2 milk um, by the way they feel, by the way it tastes, by uh, what do you say? I, I think right when you drink A2 milk, it's refreshing. Your body doesn't want to get that phlegm and you don't want to expel it. So when people tell us when they drink our milk, which I've always thought about our milk, it's refreshing. Then the gut likes it. It's very happy about it. But the interesting thing, and I haven't seen any research and maybe you know more about this, but when people have that weak gut defense and you got that foreign protein going through your body, then people are susceptible to autoimmune disease and people say, get off dairy. And that's where people really feel good. People tell me that they're, they don't have their dark, dark circles under their eyes any longer or their eczema disappeared when they started drinking our milk. They just feel good. Their joints feel better now. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of anecdotal things we hear. We're not scientists. We're the dairy farmers producing it, but we're excited to hear the good news. And then also yeah. parents of autistic children have come to me and parents that have children that have seizures have also approached us and told us stories about how their children are just so calm on A2 milk. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think in, in general sorts, we, we believe that the mucus, that the reaction in people's mouths that happens from dairy is not meant to be. That, that's a response to the A1 uh, protein and, and not necessarily happening with the A2. That's our belief. Yeah, and, and certainly, uh, you know, those were some of the original discoveries uh, in the, in the book Devil in the in the Milk that was interesting and the the interesting correlation around the world with casein A1 and uh, juvenile diabetes type 1 right. diabetes is actually rather rather shocking it's one of the things that actually convinced me that this is you know one of those troublesome proteins that right. shouldn't be in our diet um, yeah. so good for you no absolutely How, yeah. I would add, this is kind of interesting. I think you would find it, you know, intriguing here. Um, so both of our daughters have gone to New Zealand and studied at Lincoln University where Keith Woodward, who wrote the book, um, was a teacher or professor. professor. Yeah. So our younger daughter, Savannah, met with him here a couple of years ago. And so he offered us up uh, 33 pages of new data. Since the book. Yeah, <laughs> since the book. And it was really interesting because he had published it or, or uh, he, he prepared it for some talk he was doing in Russia. But, you know, I'll let Stephanie talk about the details and how he correlated it to SIDS in, in babies. And it's just mind boggling. So, yeah, and, and I haven't had time to research it any longer. And maybe people in your world or, or your listeners know about some of this. So when you have a baby that drinks infant formula and that infant formula is made with a base of milk that has the A1 protein in. Now you've got a beta casein morphine 7 that is now floating in that new little baby. 
it crosses that gut defense and then it crosses the blood, blood brain barrier and the baby goes to sleep and it's called beta casein morphine seven. That morphine seven reaction causes the baby's respiration to slow down to where they stop breathing. breathing. And then the doctor says, I'm sorry, your child has passed away. Your baby passed away due to SIDS, Southern Infant Death Syndrome. Is there a linkage between A1 protein and SIDS? So this book, um, this since the book uh, wants to say there is, and there is a research article um, published on this topic. Well, it certainly makes sense. Uh, people hear the word morphine, yeah. And it, it it's basically acts as a narcotic to yeah. suppress respirations. And yes. unfortunately, I can't tell you the number of times uh, in, in a hospital setting where we give someone uh, too much yeah. morphine for pain, and the next thing we know, they're not breathing. Now, luckily, we can rescue that with, yeah. with Narcan. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's what uh, morphine does. And... In a little baby with this morphine-like compound circulating around, that's only made from casein A1, not from casein A2. Right. Uh, it can be a real thing. Yeah. All right. I, I got. I got to wrap this up. Uh, how How hard is it to find you guys? Where are you? How do people find you? How do they get your milk and your yogurts? The best thing to do is go to our website. There's a store locator on our website. We are nationwide with a couple of our fluid milk products on the West Coast. We have a lot more choices and um, you can type in your zip code and find out, find where you can find us. And we would be excited if you want a grocery store to carry our milk. You have to just ask the dairy buyer, ask the store manager. It's the consumers asking for it that brings them into a store. And what we would really encourage is to find us on a map. So that would be a map of California, the upper left-hand corner. We're literally about a mile from the ocean and about five miles out of Oregon. And so we're way up in the corner of California, and we would welcome people to come see us. Oh, great. Yeah, we're in Crescent City, California, and it's just heaven here, always green and beautiful. And our town loves to have you visit. As well. All right. Our website. And and what's so just tell everybody again the website and the name of your milk it's www.alexandrefamilyfarm.com and that's the end it's spelled r e rather than e r right yeah on the end that that's my portuguese immigrant father that helped us do that yeah, he, he made you do it, and <laughs> yes, you, you've been cursing him ever since, probably. <laughs> oh, we love it. It's yeah. So, so uh, uh, yeah. All, so all right. So everybody, go go find this. Let's not only support uh, organic, but now regenerative agriculture. And please, 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 do yourself a favor and look for A2 milk. And if you want yeah. more information. You can find a discussion about that in The Plant Paradox and all my books. It's, yeah. it's that important. Yeah, so literally we can be found in all Whole Foods and uh, most natural food stores um, now across the country. Uh, so keep asking right. for us. So, all thank right. You. Well, thank you. Take so care much. and keep, keep up visit. the good work. Thank we you. We will. You come visit. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, now it's time for the audience question from A.S. Runkle on Instagram. I heard today on a radio show that cranberries are rich in polyphenols and drinking 100% cranberry juice has been shown to have good effects on heart and blood circulation. What info do you have on this? Well, it turns out cranberries are an incredibly rich source of polyphenol. They're also a very rich source of a sugar molecule that's called D-mannose. And those of you who have treated yourself for urinary tract infections have either taken cranberry juice or have looked for cranberry capsules or have actually taken D-mannose. Now, the problem is there's really not a whole lot of D-mannose in cranberry juice. So I encourage you the next time, if you ever developed a urinary tract infection, 
to get D mannose. Now, the problem with cranberry juice is the same problem with pomegranate juice. It's mostly sugar, and even if it says no added sugar on the label, what that means to an alert consumer is there is so much sugar in here already, we didn't have to put any more in. You're much better off buying fresh cranberries or even frozen cranberries and then throw them in your smoothie, grind them up in your blender, and eat them that way than using cranberry juice. But great question. They are a wonderful source of polyphenols. Okay, it's time for the review of the week. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gundry and team, for another fantastic episode. I am so grateful for you, your show, and all of your guests. I have learned so much over the last year regarding my journey on the plant paradox. This podcast and your books have been instrumental in my transformation this year. Thank you for always being here for us. Well, thank you for that review. And, you know, that's I'm, I'm here for you. I'm going to show up every week. We're going to bring you important information like we did today. And if you like what you're hearing, tell your friends, rate us on Apple Podcasts, because we're here to improve everybody's health. And thank you for that. We're, we're going to keep going. And as you know, I love to hear from you, because I'm Dr. Gundry. And I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.